So we are back in session, sorry, that we had our five minute break and we'll continue now with our presentation. April, are you gonna take it from here? Or? Actually, I'm gonna have Brent present it. I'm here for questions. Good morning, counselors. I'm Brent Davis, the Land Use Review Manager for Community Development. Um, I'll be presenting our biennial code updates today, and with me is our director, April Firth, and our animal control and code enforcement manager, Donna Goddard, is uh, joining us online. So some, some background on this process. Uh, staff periodically batch minor amendments to the code uh, for your consideration. The uh, types of changes that are generally included in these batches are corrections of Scrivener errors that we find in the code, uh, updates to references, um, either to other statutes or within the code itself, um, clarifying of standards when we find language that isn't clear, um, and then uh, we also include some minor policy change proposals as well. And Historically, we've called these batches of code amendments the biannual code update. Um, initially, when these were done in the past, they were done twice a year. Um, currently, we're not meeting that schedule, but we still use the process. Next slide, please. So uh, by way of process, um, we start by gathering proposed updates, um, either from prior council direction, uh, things that staff have come across in, in our work, uh, consultation with the Development Engineering Advisory Board, as well as uh, suggestions that we get from customers as they go through their projects. Next step is we prepare a preliminary draft of updates. Uh, and then uh, we took uh, this draft to Deeb last month and uh, reviewed, reviewed the updates with them and they provided a recommendation to council, which uh, was a memo that was in your packet. Um, and then the next step is, is today, uh, this work session, looking for approval to proceed with the proposed amendments. Once we have that approval, we will initiate a 60-day notice to Commerce for the changes to Title 40. And then we'll proceed with legal review of the uh, final draft of the amendments and then move into the SEPA process and planning commission for Title 40. Uh, and then uh, updates will come back to the council for uh, adoption. And that could happen in two separate batches because we have one batch that is Title 40 that does require the additional planning commission process and then another batch that is not Title 40. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm not gonna summarize the, all the changes, um, just I'm gonna go over uh, the minor policy changes that are proposed for, for both batches of code amendments. As far as Title 40 is concerned, uh, the first item is a uh, revision to address ecology comments on the adopted shoreline amendment. If you'll recall that um, council adopted a shoreline amendment and a critical areas ordinance update back in March of this year. Um, the effective date for both of those is tied to Ecology's final approval of the shoreline amendment. They have provided uh, one comment, an area that they missed in their initial review during our, our adoption process that needs to be changed and it just comes down to a, um, a minor difference in their uh, guidelines for critical areas versus shoreline. And so we're, we're bringing that amendment forward through this process. We're also proposing to uh, revise the rural ADU size and access standards to be consistent with what is being proposed in the urban area under the housing options project. Um, we're proposing uh, a change to the cottage code to remove uh, garages from the floor area calculation, and we can discuss that more if you're interested. We're also uh, proposing an increase to the public notice radius for our land use application processes. Um, we're we're uh, looking to require a pre-application conference for major home businesses. And then lastly, uh, 
we're um, looking to codify virtual, a virtual meeting option for our type 2A uh, developer neighborhood meeting process. Next slide, please. Uh, outside of Title 40, um, the uh, minor policy change amendments that we're looking at in Title 8, which is uh, animals, clarification of a definition of running at large, uh, proposed senior discount for um, cat and dog licensing fees, uh, correcting language for the urban growth area, adding a potentially dangerous dog license requirement, changing language to simplify cost recovery for hearings examiner fees upon loss of appeal, and then adding language for rabies control uh, regarding vaccination reporting. Outside of Title VIII, uh, other changes um, are restricted firearms discharge, uh, removing language to match current practice, adding a section uh, to the public disturbance noises code, clarifying nuisance language, and, and in the building code, removing uh, an exception for agricultural structures. And we have staff that are expert in these areas available today uh, if you have questions. I do have a question on this slide. <clears throat> Years ago, we heard complaints from some constituents on firearms discharge in areas across roads, near structures. And what that evolved into, and I heard from the sheriff's office that we can enforce the code that's presently written because of the way it was written. You know, how far the structures need to be, where is it measured from, specifically shooting against basically across driveways was not prohibited. Um, and then there was a lot of work done, I thought, on revising that code, uh, working with the sheriff's office on, okay, what is enforceable, you know, what, what will work for law enforcement um, responding to that kind of complaint. And, and certainly we've had a lot of um, growth and a lot of housing developments. And so the restrictions on where in the county you could actually shoot something other than um, a shotgun, you know, a long rifle. Uh, so, and then I never heard another thing. Is, is that what this, these code changes are, the culmination of that? I mean, we're talking four years ago that that was hot and heavy with uh, code enforcement in the sheriff's office to revise it. So it. I believe this has to do with shooting ranges, not in, not in open, but in the shooting ranges we have at Clark County. That this, that is what they will be amending or will be asking to be amended. So do you even know what I'm talking about? Did it ever get the code get changed? Yes, I believe Oliver and the Sheriff's Office worked together and changed okay. that. Oh, I can take a look at it. I do remember, I remember that discussion as well. I didn't, I thought it was put on pause when COVID started. So I don't think anything had changed and there is a constituent I know that had met individually with counselors about it. Uh, so we'll take a look to see um, what was submitted at that point, bring back to council on a council time and see if you want to move forward with looking into this. Yeah, that's my recollection. I think it just kind of got paused and then disappeared. But that, that's my recollection too. I met with someone, constituent who actually experienced a bullet whizzing by him and hitting his garage. Uh, so I, uh, I think it's still a very much a live issue. This change has to do with shooting ranges and requiring the sheriff's office to do inspections. Would, would this be public shooting ranges or a shooting range someone has on their property? Public. Okay. Please continue. Actually, I have a couple of questions. Um, on the ADUs and the uh, 
removing garages from cottage housing floor area. Are these, are these part of the housing options uh, suite of changes that the council was considering, but I believe was coming back to us in September. And so I don't know, is, is this moving something forward without us fully adopting the housing options uh, component? This one, the change that we have um, would be removing the garage from the cottage housing floor area, which currently the code says. Um, it's a recommendation from DEEB. It was not contemplated in the housing options study, and at the beginning of at January of 2023, the council at that time had instructed my team to bring it through biannual. And so that's why we're taking it separately from the housing option study. Got it, got it. And then I, I'm curious about the uh, ex removing exceptions for agricultural structures. What's contemplated there? I'll let Max address that one. Hi, Max. Thank you, Councillor. Um, currently, agricultural structures are exempt from building permit requirements. They're not exempt from other requirements of this code of Title 40. And removing them from that exempt list would cause them to need a building permit like any other structure in the county currently does. This is a long-standing issue in the county that's been talked about regularly. This hopes to bring our code into um, conformity or be consistent with the state building code which does not allow an agricultural exemption, if that makes sense. I, I recollect there were some changes a few years, maybe a couple of years ago, that uh, maybe narrowed the exemption. This would remove it all together. Yeah, what we did was made it inapplicable within the urban growth boundary. That's about the only big change we made because of abuses. And, and I think you may have also required kind of a, a signature under penalty of perjury <laughs> that this actually was a, an agricultural structure because people were just... I understand. Yeah, yes, that's exactly correct. So they, we removed it so that you couldn't do them inside the urban growth boundary at the time you were able to. Um, furthermore, the system we've developed um, in response to some of those issues has put a burden on staff to review these exemptions to ensure they meet the requirements and the resources to do all that are unfunded uh, because there's no permit required. And so <clears throat> they're receiving many of the benefits of review, uh, environmental zoning and other things uh, without paying for that. And uh, we think the simplest, best thing to do is to remove the exemption and have them go through the process like any other structure in the county. Um, the, the ag exemption is, is uh, in, um, existed with the idea that it was for hay, maybe livestock, and an uninhabited or unoccupied building. Um, but the way it's gone over the years, that's just simply not the case. There's always people inside them. They're not used exclusively for those items. Our ag exemption currently allows a lot of different activities instead of an agricultural structure, an ag exempt structure processing of uh, food products, forestry products, um, animals, uh, and there's been many, many abuses um, uh, that kind of exceed the bounds. And the, the bottom line is, is that the amount of time staff takes to deal with these structures um, is all completely outside of the funding mechanism of the permit. So, um, and then not to mention how many ag exemption structures wind up becoming event facilities um, for weddings and things of this nature. Um, which then those clearly aren't <laughs> ag right, and to try and permit those things after they were built without any permit or inspection is a huge burden on the person who owns it, um, and not an easy process. So, All right. Thanks for the explanation. Absolutely. Thank you. I just want to add one point to the cause the the staff time. I mean, the the seminal case that caused all the attention on that. I mean, it literally took me. A, a novice two minutes to just look at the address on Google Earth and, and see that it was in the middle of a residential development and nowhere near any agricultural land whatsoever. I mean, it would have been, what's the agricultural use? I mean, there, there, virtually no staff time would have been involved 
in that. But that was the reason why we just made the delineation to, okay, we're not going to allow that within the urban growth boundary. It was the easy, simplest thing to do to save staff time and not to worry about it. Anyway, uh, I haven't heard any complaints since. Uh, I don't know if it's still percolating out there, but. You, you may hear from people once this is proposed. Got a couple questions. Um, one is I read it the other day, but I've already forgotten. And so can you, because I had a question uh, specifically about the hearings examiner cost recovery. So can you explain that really quickly? That one is Donna, so I will introduce Donna Goddard. Good morning, um, Donna Goddard with Animal Control and Code Enforcement. Um, <clears throat> Animal Control is a general fund department, and um, we have had a significant increase in the amount of appeals um, to the hearings examiner in Animal Control, in part because we're fully staffed and there's an increase in complaints that we've taken and an increase in animal uh, violations. Um, and if you recall, um, a couple of weeks ago, we brought forth um, um, an increase to the hearings examiner fees and budget for animal control with the new contract uh, that was recently signed. Um, and currently, there's language uh, in 8.19080 that talks about frivolous appeals. Um, and so, my suggestion was to change that language to make it more clear um, and mirror what we did with code enforcement, hearings examiner uh, fees um, about a year and a half ago um, to, if the appellant does not appeal, uh, prevail on their appeal, um, that they should be responsible for reimbursing the county for the hearings examiner's costs. Oh, thank you for that. And that was uh, that last sentence you said was what where my question lied. And so, first of all, how often does an individual appeal and win? And does that happen very frequently? It is happening more frequently. Um, yes. Okay. And we do our very best. Our staff does our very best to kind of make sure that we're educating folks um, with regard to their appeal process. Um, and what is likely to, um, what the likely outcome would be of that appeal. Um, I think when it comes to animals, uh, people want to be heard uh, and, and we, we get a lot more appeals, even though we've kind of explained to them, if you've done what you've, if the, if the violation exists, you really shouldn't be appealing. Um, and we have people that will choose to appeal anyway. Okay. so. Again, this kind of gets a little bit into the weeds, but uh, and I fully agree with what you are trying to accomplish here. And also, I'm a I'm a believer in cost recovery. But one of the things that concerns me, maybe this is taken into consideration, is um, I I agree with when they lose, they should pay for those services that were were used. But I'm also concerned that when there are successful cases. Um, where an appeal is granted or they win their appeal, that the cost of that is not lumped into the people that appeal and lose, if that makes sense. I mean, I want them to pay their fair share, but not to pay for the cases where the, the county's complaint is uh, appealed successfully. Right. This is, this is just for those cases that where they would lose on appeal. If you win your appeal, you're not paying anything. Um, and we are very um, intentional with the citations and violations that we write that when we write them, we are not intending to lose any appeals that we receive. And we're very successful. Um, we have a high, very high success rate at winning uh, all of our, our citations and abatements that, and orders that we write. Okay, so my, I guess my question, final question would be, how is that going to be determined what they, what they pay? How, how will that method take place? It is the actual cost that the hearings examiner bills the county for that particular okay, case. Okay, perfect. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. 
Okay, now it's working. Um, so I guess at this point, um, we've already had some questions. Uh, the last slide in the presentation is essentially our request um, for today. So it might be just appropriate to check in and see um, how you want to use the rest of our time. If, if you had enough opportunity to review the materials and just want to ask questions, or if you want us to, to go over anything in the materials. So I, <clears throat> number one, I feel bad that we only have three of us here, but uh, two, I, I don't have any cause for concern or additional questions. You heard some of our fireworks discussion earlier and fire marshal discussion with criteria, and you know, but that, that's a little nascent yet. Uh, maybe that'll be next year's work. Uh, Glenn, did you have something specific you wanted yeah. to ask or comment yeah, on? Yeah, and this is something that I've kind of, I don't think I've ever brought it up publicly at this point, but just kind of talking with staff in the background. Uh, one of the things that I would like to look into, and I don't think it necessarily has to be this, at this juncture in time, but there are energy, energy code changes that are changing the way that construction is being required. Um, and that it, what that is doing is forcing roofs to be taller, to be higher, um, because they're now, in most cases, people are having to build the infrastructure for HVAC in between floors, so that expands the space that you have to have between floors. And then there are insulation requirements now that are requiring taller trusses. So. I would like us to adjust our height maximums to reflect some of those changes that are being coming down as a, a result of those energy code changes. In our next biannual after this one. Yeah, I think it probably could wait because I know you've got a, everybody's got a lot on their plate, but I would like to work on for sure. And I believe those code changes have been pushed until March for now too. Okay. If I may also, just to uh, give a little background to the energy code issues that go with that, um, many of those items are being required in the upcoming code where there won't be options to not do them. But many of those things have been existent as options, credits you can choose, the way the energy code is structured. Um, it's, it's basically said, very broad brush, you gotta be, make your building more efficient and you can choose how to do it. Here's a list of options. So many of those things that are actually already being done now, large scale by a lot of production builders um, with regard to designing homes around HVAC and, and having these ceilings that meet the requirements um, with high heeled trusses, and then roof pitches that stay the same. Um, it's not to say there's no need to increase the zoning allowable heights. The, the building code provides for that um, in itself, but the zoning code is a separate, separate discussion. So just to say though, it, it, is, it is happening already by many people um, and the heights are such that at least with general single family residential, now there may be some nuanced discussion when you get to cottages and other types of uh, um, um, zoning or Title 40 issues where it become, become more challenging. But a lot of that's already being done and being done within the confines of what we have. Just, just so you know, I mean, I don't think there's a huge um, pressing issue in front of us on the issue. Okay, I'd, I'd be curious, I don't know, if has, it, has there been any discussions on this at DEEB at all? I'd be interested, I know. might just bring it up. Maybe it's not much of an issue, but yeah. I, I've heard that it has, and I know that it, it the, the energy code changes. I, I've built two houses myself, and I would build them, they would be taller, you know, than what I've built in the past based on the new code. Right. I have just a couple of questions. The dark skies, the downward facing lighting, I'm not sure where that stands or if it would be eligible for the biennial code update. I think that we deemed that it was not eligible for biannual because it's a, it's a major addition. And I'm going to take the rural event center through first because that's our first attempt, ComDev's first attempt at a type four. And then um, if successful, we will take dark skies through next. 
Okay. Uh, and then um, I'm assuming we will we'll be, this will come back for adoption before the end of the year? Or will it? I think at this point we're looking at the first part of next year. Right. Okay. Because of your, your schedule. Uh, I know. Thanks. Except for maybe Title 14, 8, and 32. Yes, it's which possible, don't have to go through the planning. It's possible the the items that are not in Title 40 may come forward before the end of the year. Okay, hearing nothing further, did you hear enough? Did you get? Well, I just like yeah. I guess the last slide is up, but yeah, we're just looking today to to have you guys identify any uh, items that you would like to see us revise or remove or table for future consideration. It sounds like that's not the case. And then we're looking for approval to proceed. So I think you have the thumbs up on that and we're looking into that shooting uh, code that was worked on a while ago. And um, I think, thank you for your work. And I think that'll conclude this work session and that is the last of the three. So we can adjourn and then the, uh, does the sheriff have a meeting with you? I'm just, were you just observing? Did you want to? I was here call on Oh, okay. Okay. Well, if I had known we could have called on you, I would have done that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. We will be adjourned and then we resume at one for council time. Thank you, council. Thank you, councilors.